My name is Mike Waldron. I've been in the business, I don't know, I think four, four or five years. Three. Three, three, four years. Um, I came from new construction. I was a project manager for Toll Brothers uh, for seven years in Philadelphia and then in North Carolina. Um, it's the best business ever. Yeah, it is. Glad you're here. Glad to be here. Lisa, I've been nine years, came from Palmer Morrissey. under Gene Shaw, and uh, just had a great time. He helped guide me, and the business is moving. Opened a property management company, opened a home services company, moved downtown, life's great. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, Lisa has a mega agent office downtown Raleigh, and uh, he has a mega agent office right up around the corner on Dry Avenue, so he- I have a mega agent office. Yeah. <laughs> I've been in the business uh, since 2001 uh, and opened up my office. I got in the business on 9-11, on uh, opened up my uh, freestanding uh, mega agent office on December 1st, 2008. Uh, got, during this time frame, got married, bought a property, had three kids, uh, multiple different challenges along the way. Uh, I operate a team uh, in the 1920s on the road in downtown Cary uh, and been heavily involved in lots of different aspects of the residential real estate market over the last uh, 11 years. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, let's start out uh, because we're here to talk about new construction and I know that, that probably someone in here has a question about how do I establish value to the buyer as being represented by an agent in a new construction transaction. Sometimes there is this belief, I can just go drop them off and let them go. So let's just see each other, we'll have a chance. Let's, we have several topics to cover, so uh, just each of you have a chance to respond to that one. The, the biggest thing I can say is be present. Be, go to the office the first time don't go to the office, make sure that they have your card so that when they, a lot of builders now these days because of the market, they don't have your card and they don't know you on first visit, you won't get the help. Uh, I know the Toll Brothers does that. Um, go to the pre-drival meetings. Go to the pre-construction meetings. Go to the design center appointments. Establish value. I always say to my clients, I'm going to go to the design center appointments because I'm going to sell your house in 10 years and I want to make sure you don't pick anything horrendous. Um, you can take notes, no, by the way. <laughs> That's a note. <laughs> Obviously, I'd say it's a little nicer than that. But when you can establish value, and the more you're in a new construction center, the more the on-site people are going to trust you and value your opinion. It makes their job so much easier. Because they represent the seller. Make that very clear. They don't, they're really nice and shiny, but the first sign of a problem, they're on the seller side. Reminder of people that you're on their side um, to become that main point of contact. I mean, that's, I go to every meeting. Okay. Anything to add to that? I just had this question this week from a client that was talking to another agent about using them for new construction. And it's, there are a couple agents in our, in our area that rebate money to the, to the buyer. Right. And having that question asked over and over and over again, I've kind of honed what I say. I said, yes, you might be entitled to $2,000 back, but is that agent really going to care whether or not you get any better terms or conditions or price or any kind of upgrade? So they just drop you off, give the card, and yes, you'll get $2,000 back at the end of the transaction, but you probably have lost $20,000 in the entire transaction. So yes, my value is that I can negotiate for you. How do I look stronger than someone just giving money back? And it's okay. hard. So it it's is. Hard. It's hard to build a house. It's frustrating. It can be. What your clients can walk into a house and find a million things wrong, and that person that rebated the two thousand dollars won't answer the phone. Right. The guidance they see from an agent to me is huge. Sorry. No, no, no. That's, that's what this is for. Anything to add to that? Sure. Well, this this is my favorite topic of all the bullet points that I wrote down. As far as value about the proposition to buyers, each builder has a. They all may have certain terms that kind of sound the same, but their processes are different 
between different builders. So from whether you're picking out from, from the lot selection uh, to the floor plan, to whether it's a garage left, garage right, north, east, west, south facing, there's so many things to decide on before you even decide that that's the neighborhood for you, being the buyer, or there are times where the the buyer really wants our guidance not just for what's gonna what their life is gonna be like in a year, but like Mike said, what their life is gonna be like in ten years. So knowing everything around that community uh, and, and the process that's been finished in otherwise, being ahead of the process. In other words, go out to all of your new construction locations and establish relationships with those on site agents and understand the build process from the beginning and what terms they call lot selection, uh, you know, footprint layout, to uh, foundation, to, uh, I mean, there are, there are builders that are pulling a permit, but putting a foundation in at the same time. And a lot of buyers don't understand that you don't have, they don't wait to pull the permit, they start building. It's just how it is, and they drive by and say, wait a minute, you, you told me there was, was going to be no house there, yet look, the house is on a and a pile of wood over here and a foundation over here all day. It's different at each location. So establishing value of kind of knowing prior to uh, going on site to understand the difference in construction of Standard Pacific, MI, uh, Toll Brothers, Pulte, uh, Mungo Homes, Meritage, uh, Garmin. I mean, I can go on uh, with the different builders that are out there with different techniques. But knowing those on your end and having your cheat sheets, if you will, ahead of time will establish more value uh, in the beginning part of the process that your clients will want your guidance right from the get-go and might not even go without you uh, on site uh, to, to if that happens. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. At least I'm going to direct this question to you. Uh, I have a buyer. They say uh, we do the needs analysis. They want new construction and they would like a ranch. How do you know? Because I think everybody's aware you can't go in MLS and know when you search ranch that all the new the the uh, developments that would have a ranch floor plan aren't going to show up. So how do you do that? Today, on, on the way from leaving this appointment to the next appointment, I'll have 20 minutes after in the car. I'll be driving past the development and I'll stop in and I'll just talk to the outside agent. And I, in my car, I have a whole box of what's happening and coming through, brochures. And so I keep a mental note of where all the ranches are going. I explain to my client, for new construction here at the Gladwell Farm, because ranch is the footprint, is a little bit different and you need some more land. So just knowing the builders that are building, knowing, and I'm all over the place, like you said, I'm in all the different counties and know different projects that are coming up. I mean, there's a way to go into the MLS and put in, you know, first floor master, maybe three bathrooms of two and a half bathrooms. Like, that can kind of guide you a little bit. But you really have to eat your car driving around because they are. And I hate when a client comes to me and says, oh, I was driving by and I saw this place, but I have no idea. So I'm constantly driving around. And I make extra time in my day just to stop by one extra place every day to see an onsite agent. And it's time consuming, but that's my job. That's what I'm paid for. So it's part of your education. It is. I constantly just have to know. It. Well, and if I tell, if I, if I'm in a new construction office talking to an asset agent, I'll say, and they all know each other. I'll say, do you know where I could find a ranch? Or do you know? Oh yeah, so and so is building down the street. They all help each other as well. They all work for each other. They like there's like hopscotch way around. It's the most incestuous <laughs> business. It is. Ever. They so, all worked for the builder. They all worked. They've all worked, yeah. and they know the agents that are out there looking. Yeah. Oh, sure. Uh, well, and, and to piggyback on what Lisa said, uh, there are certain things that you should do when you're researching new construction or when you go into an office. And you should go in regularly and ask the same questions. Uh, number one is, uh, number one, ask how many houses do they have under construction? Always ask that question first. Ask them how many they're building right now. How many, how many are pre state How many are inventory? Ask them how many have they sold, and when did the when did the development start, and ask them based on that pace when do you think you'll be done. 
and either with this phase, and then that, that's the other question. What phase are you in? And what phase is coming up next? Those are the things that you want to know every time you go into uh, a new construction location because then you'll get familiar. You go back to the same location and say, wow, you had 17 houses <laughs> last time and now there's 35 houses <laughs> and you had nine under construction and last time you had two. Now you have a gauge for what's going on in that neighborhood. And for when clients ask you, hey, do you know anything about X and X development? You've done your research over time. So make sure you just have certain measurables that you can get complete information every time you go. And then always ask for uh, the lots that are available, uh, the floor plans that they might be introducing, uh, any changes uh, along the way. But in particular, knowing the pace or how, and then also how fast we went on a contract today, how long would it take to build the house? That's always, you know, that's always a key element uh, in, in that decision-making process. Uh, this is the time of year where in a neighborhood uh, that requires best view, that you'll get a brand new house without grass, because they won't plant it. Uh, buyers don't understand that. Nine months ago, when they decided on this neighborhood and waited for a certain lot to be available, now they're moving into a house with a desert, and some plans to keep alive or wrap strategically right around the house itself. But those are the types of things that when you know enough about reconstruction and you ask and you and you get out there. And then while you're out at reconstruction, walk through a couple of uh, a couple of them. Buy yourself a hard hat, keep it in the car, whatever you do. But really get on the ground and really understand what they're doing within the window. Just to feedback um, what you both said. To me, this is a, a bank of information system. So, not only visiting the sales offices and models to understand when the neighborhoods are coming in, get to know the sales team. Um, it's so important to create relationships with them because right now it's really hard to be a buyer right now. New construction really is almost the only inventory available. And you're kidding yourself if you think the builders don't know that. So, creating relationships with the people that have control of our lot releases and information is really important. Um, I call or talk to people from the major builders who only get the call. Um, I think it's just information and relationships are the most important thing for helping these clients. Thank you. Uh, practices for the negotiating a contract. Uh, I, that brought some smiles, didn't it? You know. So whoever wants to go first, you said it. They know. They know they have the product. It's really hard now. Before, you can steal a house. Now, it's, you can get blind if you're lucky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're right. Here, here, here's, one of, here's one thing that uh, I've noticed is buy, buyers are buying into a price point or buying into an area that that's where they've chosen to be, and their investment is in that home. What I'm finding is a lot of buyers are, they're adding too much. They're, they're getting every bell and whistle into the house, not understanding that in new construction and in that phase of the development, the average buyer might not be. So it's important to understand or ask back the relationship part, ask the on-site agent and learn from the on-site agent or from the uh, amenities or from uh, when they're choosing your options, what's the average person spending? Because oh, okay. if the average person is spending 30 grand in my trades and your client's at 70 grand, make sure they understand what that is. If it's $40,000 in structural, adding square footage, things like that, that's one thing, but if it's $40,000 in bamboo flooring and travertine tile, you got to be really careful. Uh, so uh, sometimes in a non-negotiating market, our negotiating goes back to advising our client more than it does negotiating with the builder, if that makes sense. Yes, it never comes down to the builder. Um, so, you know, especially this one, they're not going to sell it to somebody else. Um, and a lot of times, actually, builders, if you go over, they'll make you pay cash. Uh, in fear that it won't. Um, to 
to me, one of the biggest values you can add is having your client understand the state of the neighborhood and the state of the market. A lot of builders are now increasing prices every two homes they sell. Mm -hmm. So understanding when the right time to buy in the neighborhood is crucial. Maybe you're not getting 10 grand off, 15 grand off, but you're getting in before they increase the price by 10 grand. Because they can do it. Well, and also, this is directly from three different land acquisition and development uh, properties in the last few months. Uh, block costs, on average, are 30 to 40 percent of a, a buildable lot after it's acquired and infrastructure put in and it's ready to build on is 30 to 40 percent higher than the peak of 07 and 08. We think about that. It's 40 percent higher than the peak. Okay, so the cost of that pad for them to build on is much higher than it was in the past. For obviously for our West Cary, Apex, Dolly Springs market, it's much higher. Uh, and so we might not understand that that pricing and that sticker shock might be out there. Yet they're still not, they're not operating at huge margins because they can. It because in a lot of ways they have to, and what because they're looking at the future acquisition that they're buying now. What do you say, Mike, that they're buying now for? 2016 to 2017 production. Mm -hmm. And they're buying today in the $150,000 to $300,000 an acre of raw undeveloped land. Unbelievable. It really is. And then the cost associated with stream buffers, stormwater regulation, all of those things are increasing dramatically <coughs> because of the densities and where they're putting the houses. So, there's a lot more that that buyer is buying into than just the sticker shop price of the house. They're paying for all of those costs are transferred and through a straight uh, profit. Uh, to get back to the to, to the to the raw part of the question, right? Yeah. Negotiation. There is really no no builder ever, even in the bad times, large builder negotiating the base price. You're talking about options. Talking about block premiums, um, there's still block premiums went away in 2010, 2011, right? They're back. They're back. They're back. So <laughs> big. Yeah. big. There's room there, I would say. Um, there's room on options for some builders, but setting the expectation has been the hardest thing that I've had with my clients. They still think it's 2010, 2011. They still think they can go into a building and get 30 grand in options. So setting the expectations for them, the things that they might be able to negotiate on, if there's any negotiation, um, helps. I will say that be really careful about, and this is sort of off topic, no, it's about no, negotiation. No, be really careful about builders' lenders. Um, I, I I just built a new house <coughs> in August. Kevin did my list. Um, I didn't go with the builders, and I tell my clients to always investigate because they all, you've seen it, 3000 in closing costs, 5000 in closing costs. It's because they they pump the interest rate up, and there's fees in there. Mm -hmm. So that's another way you can show that you're adding value. Um, Kevin can beat that all day. Um, so just be real careful about the things that you negotiate and the things you tell them. It's easy to just go with the builder, but like it's with the rebated agents. The service is bad, and, and the rates are usually higher. So. And then one thing, I have construction going on now with a $750,000 house, Old Brothers. My client wanted white ceilings, all right? Old Brothers does not do white. They spray everything, build a beige, and that's just, I'm sorry, that's all we can do. My client's very upset because they're going to paint all the walls, they didn't want to have to paint the ceiling. So I went to the, the construction manager. Project manager. Thank you. Project manager said, look, all right. How much is it to do the change? Instead of spraying everything, build the base, you spray it white. Oh, yeah, that's no problem. I told it to my client. They think I'm God because I got <laughs> to do that. I'm just saying it's the one little thing that you can do for them. Right. And, and, and that all comes to the relationship. Right. And you bring up a great point. A lot of the production builders, they train their salespeople to say no. All they do is say no. Yep. So sometimes it takes it taking up a level to get the answer. 
Because the last thing, I was a project manager, the last thing I wanted to do was talk to a customer. Uh, <laughs> because normally it was an upset customer. And you end up getting a lot more when you ha have to escalate it. Because right. before, before you do anything, right. sit down with your client and just have a meeting talking new construction. Across the board, like they know nothing about it, and they don't have a house in mind or a neighborhood in mind. Take all of that out of the equation and talk about all of the basics. And you'll establish all the value you need that when you go in, I, own, I all the time, whether I'm in a walkthrough or on site, I tell my client ahead of time, you might think I just got into real estate yesterday, but that's the point. I ask the silliest, most mundane, most detailed questions when I'm in there. Not only because I'm not normally like that, but it's a lot of fun to be that, that way for my client, because otherwise they won't ask. And when I ask a question like, where are the location of the floodlights on the back of the house? Oh, we don't do floodlights. Ooh. Really? And then we leave and they say, so glad you asked about floodlights. <laughs> Like, something so easy, like, well, you've got kids, and if they're outside playing, or if you're grilling, what are you going to do? Put a flashlight on it? I mean, let's, uh, let's figure out how you're going to light up the back your backyard. It's the simplest question. So beforehand, have your list of items that you'll talk to any client about, and pretend they know nothing, and, and then t tell them then, before you meet anyone, you're going to act like you know nothing, and you're going to act ask silly questions. So if they won't even ask it, I'll say, hey, Lisa, whisper it on my ear. I'll ask it. Okay, so you talked a little bit about uh, West Perry, North West Perry, Tate Tech Conference. What it, talk about density. What are you seeing out there? What's happening? Which part do you want to understand first? Well, what's what? happening is, I mean, the new, new construction is get used to it. I mean, Apex has a lot of land to build on, but get used to the villages of Apex type style. Get used, get used to your lot line construction. Uh, the, the, the way that, it, my understanding is a builder can do one of two things. And if, he, if, he can, if they can build single family homes with a front row garage, they need a magical approval. They, they need a development approval where they can do 40 foot wide lots. Okay, back when I got into business, 40 foot lots, what? Now 40 foot lots are wide. <laughs> okay, 60 foot lots were narrow at the time. 75 foot lots were probably standard, but now you're at 45 foot wide lots because they need that magic 40 feet for a 19 foot wide garage that they call a two car. <laughs> and then when you put it on an elevated lot or a, or a uh, low grade lot, you're losing one parking spot due to staircase to get into the house. So first of all, from a, from a density, and then what <clears throat> land we have left there's a lot of land out there that doesn't, there's a lot of undevelopable portions of a parcel. And the developers will use all of that, at, and they have to, for stormwater, for raw, for buffers, and everything else. So the aggregate number of lots, for instance, there's a, I'll give you an example, 120 acres uh, in uh, West Perry, North Apex, 120 acres 60% of it is buildable. Okay, so now they're down to 72 acres for a 354 units. But the 354 units are counted on the 120 acres. So what we don't see as consumers is all the other land that has to be <coughs> unused and included in the project to get these units on the ground. Does that make sense? So going through you know, all of your open space setbacks and your uh, environmental studies and everything else, all of that costs money, uh, and all of that drives that price up. So when you're backing, it used to be when you back to a stormwater retention bond, it was a bad thing. Now it's like a premium lot. Yeah. We should not back to another person's house anymore. It's really strange, but it's true. It's true. 
So from a from a density standpoint, as you watch and see the infill process, you just seen the uh, Royal Oaks putting in the townhomes on Old Apex Road across from Laurel Park Elementary School. Right behind the right. That that was that looked like a commuter lot, and we and I thought that was going to be a doctor's office a number of years ago, and now there's going to be townhomes sitting right there. I talked to Mr. Van Tassel about it. He said, "You know what we got that land for? Now, can you tell how much how cheap it is to develop that because of what was already put into it? It was already filled in. You know, the, the, the landfill was already put in, and everything else." He said, "And in." With a two-car garage in that part of town, three hundred thousand plus, they'll sell out in, in, in two weeks. For infill, for like forty-four units, it's just amazing what's happening in short part of town. So hold on to your seats. The, the density yeah. is going to continue. Well, where I am downtown, it's all about apartments. So very few towns are coming. People are tearing down houses inside the Belt Line, inside the Belt Line, inside the Belt Line, inside the because they can. I went to the um, the state of Raleigh. In when you say monstrosity, are you saying a house or are you saying monstrosity a... house? Okay. Well, what you I said mean, you were saying a when they say property. resale, we had ten at ten. We had ten townhouses that were being built on a Christmas street right near a Christmas street train right downtown. They were as soon as they just announced them three days later, all the street were gone. There's a waiting list of 100 people on that list for ten townhouses. So I, I can't even tell you this. It depends on where you are. The density right. is different no matter where you are. How can you so, use your fence, right? Right. You just, your have to know, you just have to know. This, knowing where the, the remaining lots with yards are mm -hmm. in Apex, it creates a sense of urgency for your folks. Hey, you, know, you see all this, see how this lots are getting smaller and smaller? Not to scare some people, but you see how lots are getting smaller and smaller and smaller? <laughs> These are the, your remaining opportunities in Apex. I mean, like you said, <laughs> I live in Bella Costa, and Lenar released two lots last week, two weeks ago. 279 people on board. They released them after hours, which was insane. And so two people left half the unit. So you have to, that goes back to creating relationships, but it's understanding the sense of urgency of what's left out there before it's all villages of impact. But don't you guys find, I mean, Mr. Fletcher in our office has been amazing. He's given me so many scripts and dialogues. He's like, the school, it still revolves around those schools, and people want to be in a great, it doesn't matter where it is, the density, it all revolves around those schools. People are coming here from other parts of the United States, and they are being educated by us. We might be the only person they speak to, and they're trusting us for the schools and the areas and commute times and where the new expressway is going to be and, and helping them. Oh. And the cabs and full, I mean, and you guys, and you're trying to guide them which websites to go to. So honestly, it is more than just the density. We, we're guiding these people, and, and like you say, selling their house in seven years so they can move on to the next step. Well, and, and there's a couple of different right. things that are coming together. So it's it's kind of like I call it the gap to the the store, okay? Uh, because and it, it may it, it's not as much now, but. 20 years ago, Gap told every guy what they were wearing to work every day. If you weren't going to a couple of other stores or shopping online. Uh, and it was every shade of blue. There's not a guy in here that doesn't have 10 blue dress shirts in his closet out of 20 dress shirts. There's blue in there somewhere. I don't know if it's a blue ink thing or something, but it's amazing. And what builders are doing, builders have forecasted in the long term. So they're saying, here's what people are buying. Here's what people want. They, they're, they're not spending any time in their yards anymore. Uh, they're running around with their kids to soccer, baseball, basketball, ballet, and everything else. And they don't need that anymore, so this is what we're building. And so as long as we continue to buy it, they can continue to build it. So there's, there's no way to stop it, if you will. It's not like everyone's going to stop buying dress shirts or blue ones to change the industry. It's just not going to happen. 